lecture is Entrepreneurship, Profit and Loss. Let me say a few words about the term entrepreneur. It was the uh, French economist who first identified the function of the entrepreneur in, in um, the market economy. Um, Richard, Cant- Richard Cantillon, who was, uh, a, who was British, wrote a very famous book in 1734, which, by the way, Murray Rothbard believes is really the, um, the first work of, of economics, okay, rather than Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. But he wrote that book in French, and he used the concept and term entrepreneur. Uh, and then J.B. Say, one of the most famous French economists, writing in 1802, also um, recognized the importance of the entrepreneur. The British economists talked about the capitalists. So what they did was they, would, they conflated or they um, confused, ran together the concepts of someone who was a capital investor and someone who took risks and um, made decisions about how to use the various inputs. Okay, in the real world, of course, the entrepreneur and the capitalist are combined, generally in the same person. Okay, if you invest your money, you're both a capitalist, but you're also, remember, putting your money at risk because of uncertainty of the future. But we'll get to all of that. Right for now, um, I want to point out that the, the term entrepreneur was initially translated into English um, by uh, English-speaking economists as un- undertaker. So if you look at some, uh, uh, some uh, textbooks in the late 19th century, some American and British textbooks, you see the term undertaker used. Someone who undertakes new projects, new risky projects. But by 1920, uh, evidently, the term undertaker came to mean mortician. So it, after that, it drops out. And sometimes they used enterpriser, which is a literal trans- translation. But eventually, they, they began to use the, the French term entrepreneur in the English um, literature. Okay, so that's the term that we have today, entrepreneur, and that's a little bit of its history. Okay, what I want to start out by saying is that the concept of entrepreneurship and of profit and loss are embedded in in the very notion of human action. Okay, every action is in in a very important respect entrepreneurial. Okay, and I'll explain why. And every action also involves the possibility of, of, of profit and loss. Now, not in monetary terms, but in subjective terms. Mises calls it psychic profit and psychic loss. Now, let's start, we can start with Mises' statement that all action is embedded in the flux of time, okay, and involves un- uh, uh, speculation. No matter what you do, you're speculating on the future. You're speculating that what you give up, the opportunity cost, is less than what you receive. Okay. So if the benefit from an action is greater than the cost of an action, you gain a psychic profit. You can't measure it in cardinal terms. All you know is that what you gave up would have given you lower satisfaction than what you received. Let me give you an example. Let's say, um, in coming to the Mises uh, University, um, you give up the possibility of, of working for that week and earning $300. Okay? And you also, let's say, give up the possibility of going camping for a week with your friends. So you're speculating that the satisfaction in terms of knowledge and so on that you gain from the Mises University is greater than those other alternatives. And let's assume that the $300 is the second alternative. Okay? That becomes the opportunity cost. Now, if you're correct in your speculation, if you like the professors, okay, if they don't bore you to tears, okay, if you learn new things in the lectures and so on, then you may, at the end of the action, say, I benefit, my benefit was greater than the cost. I'm happy I came. I do not regret coming. I do not regret renouncing the $300. Then you've gained a psychic profit. But if you don't like the professors, if if there there was, um, if you didn't learn much here, uh, if you didn't like to interact with the others and so on, you regret your action, which means that if you had to do over again, you would have chosen the $300. So, in that case, the cost, what you gave up, had a greater value to you, the expected satisfaction from $300, than what you got, the, the, the benefit from the Mises University. That's a psychic loss. Okay? So everyone, um, every, every a human being, as soon as they are old enough to deliberately pursue goals, as soon as they're old enough to confront scarcity, that means, that is, they, they can't get everything they want, so they have to choose what's most important to them, at that point, they become entrepreneurs in a very general sense, in a very real sense. 
Okay. So it's important that everyone is an entrepreneur. You must have friends or acquaintances that consistently make bad decisions. They choose the wrong thing. In, in rest, restaurants are a perfect example when you look at the menu. Okay? You have to renounce every other thing on the menu except the... Uh, well, most of us do. Um, every other thing on the menu except the one entree that you choose, right? That right there opens up the possibility of psychic profit and psychic loss. Okay? So... People are continuously acting entrepreneurial. Or act, acting entrepreneurially actually is an oxymoron. Uh, not an oxymoron, it's redundant. Okay? Um, whenever you act, you are exercising entrepreneurship. Okay. So, right from the start, there's an, an entrepreneurial aspect to all human action. However, okay, the entrepreneur that we're interested in, the entrepreneur that directs production, is really a, a, a more limited class of people. Okay, now, to distinguish between everyday entrepreneurship that we all um, engage in and the entrepreneurs who, who, who organize production and undertake risks within the market economy, Mises uses the term promoter entrepreneur. In fact, somewhere in human action, Mises says that it would have been better if we use the term entrepreneurship simply to denote the everyday exercise of, 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 of foresight of the future, of forecasting of the future, and, and use the term promoter to indicate that special class that are so good in forecasting the future and adjusting their actions to the future um, that they become the ones that run the, the enterprises in society. Okay, but for now, we'll use promoter entrepreneur to mean that class of people that organizes, directs uh, bi the businesses. Now, who are these people in a, in a general sense? Well, they tend to be the people that are most successful in their everyday lives in forecasting the future and undertaking actions that bring them a psychic profit. Now, given that, Okay, given that they're successful, they try their hand at entrepreneurship on the market. And what Mises says about entrepreneurship on the market is that the entrepreneur or the entrepreneurs are, are, are a class of people who want to earn their living by forecasting the future and adjusting, better adjusting production to future consumer wants. So they're not, as we'll see later on, putting, they're not a factor of production. They're people that are making decisions about how to use the factors of production. They believe at any moment in time that they can make better decisions about those uses than the market, okay. than, than, than are being currently made on the market. Okay, what's the specific function? How would we define the promoter entrepreneur? Um, the promoter entrepreneur is the person who organizes and directs the factors of production. That is land, labor, and capital. He's the one that decides what to produce, how and where to produce, that is, what technology to use, where to locate, and what quantities and qualities to produce. So he's responsible, ultimately, for all the decisions regarding what's produced okay, in his firm. So in some sense, we call him the ultimate decision maker in production. Now, if you're the ultimate decision maker in production, and production always takes time, if you're producing a new automobile, as I mentioned, um, it takes between five and seven years for a new automobile to come from the drawing board to the dealer's showroom. Okay, so you're looking at a market five to seven years in the future, which means you have to have an idea about how consumers are going to value automobiles in, at, in this future market. You can look at present prices of automobiles and present costs of automobiles okay, as a starting point, but then you have to exercise your entrepreneurial imagination to, con to, to, to conceive how things will change over time. If OPEC will, will restrict, continue to restrict the supply of oil in the next five years, which will mean gasoline prices will go up, which will mean that consumers will tend to value smaller cars more than they did before. Okay, you have to make those sorts of decisions. Um, for example, in, in the 19, early 1970s, 60s, 70s, early 70s, the U.S. Um, automotive companies, okay, the big three in Detroit, were um, enormously profitable, enormously successful. Okay? They built big, comfortable, powerful, gas-guzzling cars. Okay? And, and American consumers responded very favorably to these automobiles. However, after the first oil shock, after OPEC raised the price of oil for the first time in 1973, 
they, they, they exercise a, a, a misjudgment of the future. They say, well, you know, the U.S. has always had cheap oil prices. The U.S. government will do something to keep these prices cheap. They're not going to continue to go up. They'll come back down again. We're going to continue exact to do exactly the same thing that we did before. Okay? And they continued to do that throughout the 70s, uh, producing large cars. They still were pretty successful. But oil prices were creeping up. Gasoline prices were creeping up. By 1979, we had the, the war between Iraq and Iran, which interrupted supplies of oil to the West. OPEC raised the price again. And um, at that point, um, Japanese auto producers, who were used to high prices and who forecast that prices of oil were going to be higher um, than they were pretty, pretty much permanently, uh, began to aggressively market compact and subcompact automobiles here in the United States. So they correctly forecast the future and appraise prices. That is, believe that the prices of, of larger cars were going to fall and of smaller cars were going to go up and that they'd earn a profit. And indeed, they were right. By 1981, Chrysler was on the verge of bankruptcy because of its bad entrepreneurship. And uh, it was bailed out. Iacocca went to the Reagan administration and petitioned them. And um, they, they bailed out Chrysler. They put on basically um, import barriers to Japanese cars, restricted the number of Japanese cars into the U.S., raised the price of, Jap of water, all, all automobiles in the U.S., uh, and, and for a while the U.S. companies became profitable again. But there were still quality problems with U.S. cars and so on, and um, they again were losing money in the mid-80s, and they eventually had to adjust. Okay? But the point was it was bad entre entrepreneurship. Okay? Regardless of their past success, if you don't continually... Um, correctly forecast how consumers are going to demand things in the future, you're going to fall behind, okay, no matter, regardless of your past success. I'll come back to that point again when we'll discuss IBM. Okay, now, uh, the other point I want to make is that, um, so, so therefore the most important function of, of the promoter entrepreneur is to forecast the future and to appraise future prices. What will prices be in the future when, when, when the output of my production process uh, comes onto the market? Okay, the other point we want to make is that the promoter entrepreneur in the real world owns some capital. Okay? That is, he's also a capitalist who puts his money at risk. It's very unlikely that anyone with nothing but a good idea could get backing from someone. Now, promoter entrepreneurs can also get credit from others that trust their judgment of the future. Okay? So a promoter entrepreneur has, usually has capital of his own as well as amass capital from, from others who are willing to, to trust his judgment about the future. But even the others that lend the money to the promoter entrepreneurs are themselves promoter entrepreneurs. They are putting their money at risk. Okay. Now remember, since production takes time, the factors of production, the, the workers and so on, want to get paid every two weeks. So if, if you're producing, um, involved in producing something that's going to come out of the market in two years, uh, you must pay all the factors of production in advance. So you, you pay your costs, you incur your costs before you find out what your revenue will be from that production process. Which means then, you are what, what the economists call the residual claimant. The promoter entrepreneur is the residual claimant. That he, he gets left, he gets what's left over after the revenue has been received, okay? If, Revenue exceeds cost of production. If it turns out that revenue is greater than cost of production, then he earns a monetary profit. So now we're in the world of, of the market. Okay? We're talking about monetary profits, which are, which are measurable, which are quantifiable, rather. Uh, on the other hand, it could be the case, um, as it was in the case of, of IBM in 1992-1993, that um, all their decisions that were made during the 1980s in, in continuing to produce mainframe computers turned out to be incorrect. So that in those two years, in 1992-1993, they lost $13 billion. Okay, there were $13 billion in the red. Did, did the workers suffer any of that loss? Did the workers that were carrying out the decisions of, 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 of the IBM entrepreneurs during the 80s bear any of those losses? Of course not. They got paid every two weeks or every month or whatever their salary schedule was. Okay? Nor did the, 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 the landowners that... that sold them or rented them um, various resources. Okay? They rented land and so on, and they paid as they went along. So it was the stockholders, the entrepreneurs, um, who suffered that loss. So, 
We also, another characteristic of, of, of the entrepreneur is that he or she is the sole risk bearer in production. If the, if the production is successful, they gain. If it's um, unsuccessful, they are the sole bearers of the loss. Now, later on, what, IBM will cut back and fire workers. Okay? But that's a forward-looking decision. Okay? Those workers haven't directly um, been hurt by or been injured by, the, by these, these wrong decisions. They got paid during that production process. Okay, what is the difference between owners and managers? Because there tends to be confusion in mainstream economics regarding the uh, distinction. Uh, let's keep in mind that the entrepreneur is generally a single person, uh, at least in a new firm, a startup firm, and that he can't be everywhere at once. Okay? That he can set out the plan for the use of the factors of production. He can determine what technology to use in a general sense and uh, what products to produce in a general sense and of what quality. But he must have people carrying out these decisions. Okay? These people, which um, Mises calls them uh, the junior partners of the entrepreneur, are the managers. They are not directly involved in the production process. They oversee the production process and make sure that there's no um, superfluous costs that are incurred. Okay? Their job is to keep costs down and to adhere to the plan. Their job is also to make decisions, daily decisions, that um, arise as a result of, 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 of changes, okay? of changes that are going on. In other words, you must have a flexible plan and uh, since you can't be everywhere, you need someone who's on the spot and can make, make those sorts of decisions. Now, it's important to realize that the manager, the manager's income does depend on profits, okay? He, if he successfully gets bonuses, okay? Uh, even if he's strictly on, 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 on a salary basis, um, if he's unsuccessful, continually unsuccessful, uh, his, his department within the firm, he can get fired. But what Mises points out is he's not an entrepreneur because he is never responsible for losses. The entrepreneur can have a negative income. The manager cannot have a negative income. Okay? So though his, his, his income tends to fluctuate according to how successful he is, he himself is only a junior partner of the entrepreneur. He is not the entrepreneur. Okay? Murray Rothbard gives a good example of this. Uh, because, by the way, in the 1950s, there, there, um, or actually even as early as the 30s, there were economists, for example, in the 30s, Burley and Means, two economists, uh, two New, New Deal economists, claimed that firms were no longer controlled by the owners. Okay, that there was a separation between ownership and control. Uh, the owners owned the, the firms in some sense, in a nominal sense, but they didn't control the everyday operations. Okay, the, the top management controlled the everyday operations. And this theme was um, uh, re, uh, rejuvenated in the 1950s by uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, okay, who's, who's or actually early 60s when he wrote The New Industrial State, uh, and his claim was that the technocracy, okay, the top scientific personnel, engineering personnel, and managers control the firm. And if you look at the firm on an, and, and you watch its operations on an everyday basis, it appears as if it's true that, that, that the managers are making all the decisions. But Murray Rothbard had a good response to this. He said, well, let's assume that you're um, one of the Rockefellers. And you have this huge estate. And uh, you come up to the estate on the weekends and, um, or once a month, whatever it is, and you have a gardener. You hire a head gardener who plans out all the landscaping. Okay. Doesn't, and, 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 you know, somebody observes a gardener. It looks as if the gardener is, is, is the one who's, 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 who's ultimately making all these decisions. But, as, Murray point, as Rothbard pointed out, um, when you come to this estate um, on the weekend, if you don't like something, you say, move that. I don't like that there. Okay. Get that tree out of there. Okay? And if you don't like what he's doing, you just fire him. Okay? So it really is the owner that's the ultimate decision maker, even though he's an omnipresent. Okay? Even though he's always looking over the shoulder of the managers. Now, in the corporate firm, okay, and I don't want to go into this in too much detail, there are mechanisms by which the managers can be disciplined into running the firm in the interests of the, the uh, owner entrepreneurs. First of all, the board of directors represents the, um, uh, the, uh, the stockholders' interests, and certainly the board of directors can fire the management, and that's happened. Okay? They can fire the management if they don't like what's going on. The firm isn't earning profits. Secondly, the stockholders themselves, or, or stockholders that are more prominent in the firm, the larger stockholders, can get together and organize what's called a proxy fight, 
where they can, can and do uh, vote out the current management and, and, and replace them with a new team of managers. But really, most importantly, there's really a market for corporate control. Okay? Other entrepreneurs okay, that are the heads of other firms, other successful entrepreneurs, can look around and see firms whose stock prices are low okay, because their profits are low. Um, and for example, as small stockholders are instrumental in this. Okay? If small stockholders, stockholders in general, don't like the way the firm is being run, and they're not large enough to exercise any direct influence by organizing a proxy fight, they can begin to sell their stock and buy stocks in other firms okay, that are more successful. That will cause the price of the stock to fall. Okay? At some point, the price of the stock will be so low that other corporate raiders or, or people that, that, that want to take a hostile takeover uh, will we'll begin to look and say, the, given the resources that that firm controls, I can increase the profits and therefore earn a big capital gain. So if a firm is, the total stock price of a firm is $500 million and um, uh, someone else says, you know, I think I can reorganize that firm so that um, its price was up to $600 million. Well, there's a $100 million profit that that person can earn by, by buying up the stock, by taking over the firm, reorganizing it. So the, the, the managers, top men, know this. Okay? They're, not, they're not blind to this. They realize this. That's why they're so worried about their stock price. Because as the stock price come, goes down, they become better and better candidates for a hostile takeover, in which case they lose their jobs. Okay? A new management team comes in, they're thrown out. Um, it was very interesting in the late 1980s when everyone was uh, berating the, uh, uh, all these corporate raiders that were taking over firms and spinning off inefficient departments of firms and, and you know, taking the firm apart or, or merging it with other firms. Um, there were a lot of letters, if you, if you watch the New York Times and the, and the Wall Street Journal, uh, complaining about this. But many of those letters were signed by <coughs> the, the heads, the, the CEOs of existing firms that were in trouble. And their complaint was always, well, we're looking towards long-term profit. Okay? We're looking towards long-term profit. The corporate raiders just want to make a quick buck. Okay? But the whole point is that when, for those of you who had finance, the market capitalizes long-term profits into the stock price of the firm. Okay. If, you, if, if there's profits, if, if a firm is currently losing money, and, and, uh, but, but people trust the management and believe that in three or four years, this strategy is going to turn high profits. And remember, most new firms lose money for the first two or three years. Um, then, in fact, the stock price will be high, will reflect the expectation that this team is doing a good job. So... Um, the market disciplines managers to run uh, the uh, firm in the interest of stockholders. Remember now, I'm not trying to say that managers want to do this. Okay? There is what's called an agency problem. Uh, remember, if you're a manager, you would like to have, um, a, a, let's say, a limousine always available to take you and your family wherever you want to go, paid for by the firm. You would want to have a helicopter always on call. You would want to hire um, two pretty secretaries that are incompetent instead of having one who can do her job. Okay. But all of these things do what? They raise costs. And, co and higher costs cut into profits. And when that happens, when profits begin to fall, then there's an effect on the, on the um, stock price of the firm. Okay. So that behavior, though it might not be completely stamped out by the market, is kept within very, very narrow um, constraints by the market for corporate control. Now let me talk a little bit about the income of the entrepreneur. The profit and loss. Now we're talking about monetary profit and loss. When we talk about profit, you must be careful to distinguish between the, uh, the accounting concept, conception of profit and the um, economic conception of profit. Okay. We simply define profit in economics. We, by the way, we use the Greek symbol, symbol pi to, um, to denote profit because P is usually, we use P for price. So profit is defined as the difference between total revenue, TR, and total cost. But the economic conception of total cost is different from the accounting conception, and probably from the layman's conception also. So let me just take a very simple example. Let's say you have a small um, landscaping firm uh, that's run by uh, uh, the owner. Okay, the owner himself is on the spot, manages it, runs it, invests in it. And uh, then in a given year, the owner of this firm generates a revenue of $120,000. Okay. And his out-of-pocket costs are, let's say, $100,000. 
So the accountant would, his accountant would say, well, you know, you earned your net earnings or your profit was twenty thousand dollars. But before the economist would, would um, assent to this calculation of profit, he, he or she would have to know a few other things. Okay, first of all, if in fact the manager or, or the owner managed the firm, okay, what was the value of his labor? Assuming that that this is just simply the out-of-pocket expenses. You have to assign a value to his labor. You have to account for the value of the labor resource that he provides. And let's assume that he could run another small firm as a manager. He could be hired on the market for $30,000. So what we're doing here as economists is, is accounting for what are called implicit costs. Not costs that are, 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 are explicit in terms of money, but costs that are incurred in the, in the sense of opportunity costs. So he's giving up $30,000 as a manager of another firm to run his own firm. Let's also say that um, this $100,000 doesn't include any payments to the bank because he's financed the firm himself. Okay? He hasn't borrowed the to pay the wages and, 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 and to buy the various tools you need and, 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 and other inputs for the um, landscaping firm. He has used his own savings. Okay. Well, once again, you have to account for the foregone interest. Okay, so you have foregone wages, foregone interest. Let's assume we could have put this money into a certificate of deposit, very low risk, at 10%. Well, his foregone interest, in the sense of the opportunity cost, is $10,000. Finally, let's say he uses his, uh, a dump truck in the firm, and it's his own. He owns a dump truck. Uh, and let's assume that... Um, he could have leased that out at $5,000. So that's a foregone rent. We add up these implicit costs and it gives us $45,000. Okay. So for the economists, we account for the total cost as $145,000. In which case, this person has earned a pure loss okay, of $25,000. Negative. Now some people say, well, that's not intuitively... Um, I mean, that's not intuitive just to think that he's actually lost money, even though the, the amount of money that he's received is greater than the amount of money he paid out. But in fact, it is. Think about it this way. If he never started this firm, left his capital in the CD, went to work for, for someone else, and um, leased out his truck, at the end of the year, he would have the full $100,000 sitting in his bank, sitting in the certificate of deposit, and he would have this real income, this $45,000 of income. So unless he makes at least $145,000 in this firm, he's losing money in a real sense, in a sense that will affect his actions. Usually we call this $45,000 normal profit in economics. So entrepreneurial profit is anything that exceeds normal profit. So even if he made $145,000 in total revenue, he would just be breaking even. Breaking even. But he would stay in the business, okay, because he's covered all of his costs. And he's received payment for his managerial labor, as well as a return on his, on his capital. So when we say that a firm is just breaking even, okay, we're not implying that they're not making any money at all, okay. They're making a return to all of their resources, and they're making a normal rate of return on their capital. So that's why a break-even firm would stay in, in, in business, okay, why well, they would stay in the, um, in the industry. Okay, now, what's the what's the social function of of um, profit? Okay, it's pretty clear that the if a profit is earned, the entrepreneur benefits. Okay, he's better off. But what about consumers? Okay, the economy as a whole, are they better off when entrepreneurs earn a profit? In fact, they are a lot better off. Let's take a very simple example. Um, a few years ago, uh, there were remember the, the Cabbage Patch doll craze. And after that, there was the, the Beanie Baby craze. Every Christmas, uh, some sort of new toy comes up that kids go crazy over. Okay? And I remember that the, um, let's take a simple example, the Cabbage Patch doll craze, th they were selling out. I mean, women were fighting each other to get them. I mean, there, there's actual pictures in the, on the news. You saw you know, with, uh, women, uh, nice ladies grappling with each other for, for these Cabbage Patch dolls right before Christmas. And they were selling out at, at $75. And yet their costs were very low. 
Okay, there's a big profit margin. Let's say it's, I'm not sure what the average cost is, but let's say it was twenty dollars. Okay. All right. So again, we're using average costs in the economic sense. This includes all costs incurred, include, including interest costs and so on. Now it's pretty clear that the entrepreneur benefited. The, the owners of Coleco, I think, was, were the producers, um, and they made fifty-five dollars. But what's the effect of this profit on consumers? Well, what Mises points out, what the Austrians point out in general, is that it has a beneficial effect on consumers. Because look at it this way. The $20 represents the cost of all the resources used in the production of the doll. Now, why, why do the producers of the doll have to pay the $20? They have to pay the $20 because other entrepreneurs want to use those same resources to produce other things, other types of toys, and so on. And as, as, as we know, other entrepreneurs will, will bid for those resources right up to the point where they believe that consumers, right up to the price that they believe consumers will pay for the product. Okay. So the $20 then reflects the most valuable alternative use of those resources. So the, the plastic, the labor time, the machine time, all of the things that were used in producing those Cabbage Patch dolls could have been used to produce, in other industries, goods that are worth the consumers about $20. Goods that they're willing to pay about $20 for. Now, what has an entrepreneur done? He's taken an idea, a pure idea, okay, of this new doll. He's appraised the future, believes that, if you remember these dolls, they were, they were sort of each individualistic. Okay, they, they, each one had a different face. They had uh, birth certificates and different names. They were ugly and scary looking, I thought, but, but, the, <laughs> but the, kids, the kids responded to them. Okay. So, what he said was, I'm going to take these resources that are producing all these other things, recombine them in a new way, and sell them on the market. And look what happens. Consumers believe that that new combination of the same resources is worth much more than the older combination. So, what does an entrepreneur, what does an entrepreneur, do, entrepreneur do every time he earns profits? He reallocates resources from lower valued uses to higher valued uses. And in the inter and, and, and in, in the event, he um, benefits consumers. Now, is that the end of the story? Okay, does he go on earning profits forever? No, there's always a tendency for profits to disappear, because profits act as a signal and an incentive, as we say in economics, to entrepreneurs. It grabs their attention. It says, "Look, look at these screaming women." Look, look at the $75 that they're willing to pay for these dolls that are, that, that are only bought in $20. Okay. So what they begin to do is to, pay, to make similar, the same or very similar products. As they do that, the other entrepreneurs begin to bid for the same sorts of resources that the successful entrepreneur has bid for. That drives the average cost up, and it begins, they begin to supply the market with additional uh, output of, of the same or similar good, which drives the price of this good down. So eventually... And, and this did happen after Christmas pretty, pretty quickly. Um, there were imitators. The prices came down to, let's say, $30, okay, where price was equal to average cost. At that point, the market has adjusted. At least that market has adjusted. Okay. Now, when, when price and, and average cost is equal, it simply means that there is no better use for these resources. They're, they're, they're being used to produce goods worth $30 to consumers in, 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 in the doll industry, and that's what they're worth is everywhere else. There's no more maladjustment in the economy. There's no more wrong use of, of um, the uh, resources. So entrepreneurship tends to ensure that resources are never used in undervalued ways, in ways that, 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 that could be improved upon. Okay? The profit motive brings that about. Let me give you a very interesting example uh, recently of, um, and, and you don't have to have a, you know, I mean, you don't have to have a highly technical idea. It can be just a very simple idea that can earn profits. Um, this occurred in, this story occurred in, in 1990. There was a woman who was um, a Dallas-based IBM ma mainframe saleswoman, okay, which of course was a dying industry by then. Okay. Um, and one morning she was getting ready for work and she looked in the mirror and she noticed that her, her blonde ponytail looked a little drab. So she found that she could braid her ponytail by using a makeshift device consisting of a plastic loop and a knitting needle. Okay, it's a little thing she made at home. Um, well, what happened was that uh, she was laid off. Well, actually, even before she was laid off, by the way, she was only 32, um, 
She plunked down $5,000 to get a patent on, on this little device, which she called Topsy Tail. Okay? Um, and she went around and tried to sell the idea to various companies. Uh, it, basically, no one, no one really wanted, no one bought the idea. So what she did, she paid for a mold on her own, a mold to make the thing, uh, with $9,000 in, in, in savings. And she found a, a plastics maker who could produce as many topsy tails as she needed for about 50, 50 cents each. Okay, so she had small overhead and, and she had 50 cents a piece to, to produce these things. Um, the first, she put an ad in the paper by April 1991. She had orders worth $1,000. She filled them herself from her home, um, stuffing topsy tails into uh, envelopes at night. Um, by 1991, by the end of 1991, she was moving 200 and had to enlist her cleaning lady to help stuff 400 envelopes each week. Um, a few weeks later, she got out what turned out to be her big break. IBM fired her. They eliminated her job. Um, it was really a load off my mind, she said, who wanted to work full-time expanding top details. So what she did was she, she got her $25,000 early retirement package and... Um, she lived off that money while she began to, to, to sell the product. Now, uh, she, she made some very good decisions. Um, she, she, she decided she had to go on television. So she, she, she looked for someone to help her go on TV. And uh, a small company in New Jersey um, put together a simple, simple two-minute commercial message. Okay? She appeared in the commercial and uh, began to um, and offered the good for, for a dollar a piece. Okay, well, the strategy worked. She sold... Uh, on her own, she sold about 250,000 topsy tails. She was, I'm sorry, yes, she was selling them at $10 a piece in 20 months. So she was selling them at $10. They cost a little bit more than 50 cents to make. She sold 250,000 of them. Okay, so that's 2.5 million. In the first six months after commercial hit, the networks in, in 1992, um, the, the TV, uh, uh, she sold another 3.6 million at $15 a piece. Okay, so the gap is fifteen dollars fifty cents or whatever it is. Um, then she went on a QVC network. Great entrepreneur. Um, she sold five thousand topsy tails at fifteen dollars each in, in eleven minutes. In her first eleven minutes. Now, what's her biggest problem? Imitators. People have jumped in to make these. Okay, as soon as they saw how successful she was, um, she sp already spent. Or she had spent by nineteen ninety three a hundred thousand dollars suing counterfeiters. Okay, um, and they're selling for as little as five dollars. Uh, she never earned more than eighty thousand dollars a year at, at IBM. She's now a multimillionaire. Um, she was reduced. The, now there's another way of earning profit. Okay, let's assume that you, you have um, imitators push the cost down to fifty cents. So the supply, you know, the supply increases, so, and, and, and the cost is fifty cents. Okay. Well, you're just breaking even. But can you continue to make profits? Yes, you can lower the, come up with a new technology, a new way of producing them to lower the cost, which is exactly what she did. Um, they cost 22 cents to make now. And, you know, so um, she's making, I mean, she made millions. Now, I haven't heard about her doing anything since 1993, 1994, but um, that's just an example of entrepreneurship. Now, were consumers better off? Yeah, because she took, she took a, a, a needle and a piece of pl a plastic loop that... Had fit, was worth 50 cents in, 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 in other uses, put them together, combined them in a new way, and they were worth $15 in the new use. Okay? So she reallocated resources from lower value to, to higher valued uses. The other uh, example I like to give, other historical example, which I'll give you, has to do with the, the ballpoint pen. Okay? I don't know if you know about the history of the ballpoint pen, but ballpoint pens weren't produced until the mid-1940s. Okay? Before that, uh, people used to use those, those, those messy, um, what are they called? Um, fountain pens, yeah. Uh, and you know, they were messy and, and they, they weren't very reliable when you wrote. There was always splotches and stuff, uh, at least for me. Um, so what happened, but, but when they first come on the market, uh, ballpoint pens were extremely expensive, 20 or $30. I'll, I'll get to the price in a moment. And they were luxury items. Like just as you would leave a BMW in your driveway, people would have guests over. They would leave, you know, ballpoint pens on the coffee table, let them know that they were, they were doing well. Um, but, but this shows how entrepreneurial competition benefits consumers in society. 
Um, let me just tell you the story of this. In 1945, Milton Reynolds, a company, uh, actually an individual, patented a new type of pen, okay, the ballpoint pen. Um, he started the Reynolds International Pen Company. He commenced production in October of 1945. Um, and then he sold the pen to Gimbel's. Gimbel's was a, is a big, was a big retail store in New York that competed with Macy's back then. Uh, they, um, they introduced the pen at $12.50, okay? The, the cost was estimated at 80 cents. Okay, so you had 12.50 as the price, 80 cents as the cost, enormous profit margin. Um, by early 1946, uh, Reynolds had expanded tremendously. They had 800 people in the factory and they were producing 30,000 pens per day. Macy's then introduced an imported ballpoint pen at $19.98. In April, okay, a few months later, um, Ebersharp, another company, introduced the model at $15. And then Schaefer introduced the pen at $15. Um, Reynolds introduced a new model. Okay, remember Reynolds was selling a new model. Um, and, ke and but kept the price at, at 12, 12, uh, 12.50, but cut the cost to 60 cents for ballpoint pen. Um, an another pen company introduced the pen at 9.95. Okay, uh, Reynolds responded by cutting its price to 3.85, with the cost now pushed down to 30 cents. Okay, by February 1947, less than two years after it was introduced, Gimbel's was selling a pen uh, at, for 99 cents. Okay. Um, prices were then pushed down to 88 cents, and um, by 1948, three years later, the pen was um, selling at 39 cents, full point pens, and they caught, the price was pushed down to 10 cents. So relentless entrepreneurial competition not only introduces new products, but it, it pushes the cost down continually. Okay, in order in order to, to, to keep earning profits as competitors enter that area where you're producing, you have to continually find ways to lower the costs. Okay? So that's the natural operation of the market process. You don't need any government to say prices are too high. The tendency is to drive prices down, okay? as long as there's, 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 oh, there's free entry into the market. Now, one thing we want to say about profit, and that is uh, something else about profit. What really, where does, ultimately, where does profit come from? Okay? If profit always tends to disappear, there's always a tendency, because of, 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 of competitors, to wipe profit out. There's always a tendency for firms to break even. Okay? On the other hand, by the way, if you're losing money, um, there's a tendency for losses to disappear too. Because, uh, for example, the U.S. auto companies were producing large cars in the early 1980s, and they were losing a lot of money. Let's say they were, producing, they were, they were selling large cars at a cost of $15,000, okay? Uh, new cars, and the average cost is 20000 Okay, so they were losing $5,000 per, per, per unit. Okay, what would happen to change that? Well, what would happen was that the U.S. automakers realized that they were suffering these losses and that things weren't likely to change, so they began to produce fewer and fewer large automobiles, and they began to retool and produce compact and subcompact automobiles to compete with the Japanese producers. Okay. Eventually, the supply of, of large automobiles fell drastically. There were still some around. So the price rose, let's say, to 18000 This is just hypothetical. And on the other hand, certain resources that they were bidding for um, came down in price because people, fewer people were bidding for those resources that were specific to the larger cars. So to make a long story short, you tend to have a break-even also where you have losses. Okay. Well, if that's true, why did, hasn't the market economy long ago settled into a situation where everyone breaks even, everyone earns the same 10% on their investment, and no one earns large profits. In other words, why are profits continually and losses regenerated in the market economy? Preferences change. Right? Preferences change. Um, not only preferences, but technology changes. Available resources change. Gasoline becomes more expensive or becomes less expensive, so people change their demands for various products. So it's change that brings... Profits result from nothing else but change. Okay, doesn't result from, from large companies restricting supply and trying to keep prices high. Okay. It doesn't result from um, uh, uh, the work in certain industries being hard, so they have to earn profits because it's more risky. Okay. Take an example. Um, 
the, IBM. IBM was, 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 was very, very successful with its mainframes. And when you said the term com- IBM, it was synonymous with computers. And yet IBM, as I, I, I said I would mention, lost $13 billion in two years, 1992, 1993. Okay? Why? Because an individual named Stephen Jobs, or Jobs, I don't know how to pronounce it, the guy who created the Apple computer and, and was, and was um, one of the founders of Apple Computer, he saw that back in the, in the 1970s, okay, and by the way, IBM had developed the technology for the personal computer, okay? but, but, but the, um, I forget who the CEO of IBM was at the time, basically said, well, this is a toy for households. It, it will never be the mainstay of our business. Businesses will not, will not, rege- will not ever um, move from the mainframe and mini computers to the personal computers. So, so they, he, he made a bad decision. Okay? Based on that decision, they continued to produce a mainframe. But Stephen Jobs saw things differently, saw the future differently than, than IBM did, and began to aggressive, aggressively market these small personal computers. Okay. And the rest is, is history. Okay. But that, so now suddenly profits were generated in this industry. And, 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 and mainframes, because of the change, became much less profitable. And in fact, after a while, you know, they, they were suffering losses. So that's the source of new profits. One other thing I want to, uh, a few other things I want to say about profits. Um, no entrepreneur can see the future perfectly. No one knows exactly what consumers want at every given moment in time. Okay, but the entrepreneurs that, that offer better products than other entrepreneurs are the ones that offer products or that that that, that um, gain a profits. Okay, um, one way of putting this is that consumers rank entrepreneurs ordinarily. There's an ordinal ranking. They look around, they see what's out there on the market, and they decide to buy certain things and to abstain from buying other things. Okay? Those things that they like best are the things that are profitable. Those things that they like least of what's being offered are the things that, 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 that tend to lose money for their, their producers. Okay? The best, the best entrepreneurs gain more and more capital. They have more profits, therefore they have more money to invest, therefore they expand their decision-making power over resources. We call that the selective process. The profit and loss process is a selection process. On the other hand, if you're an entrepreneur that continue, continues to make bad decisions, okay, and you lose money, your capital shrinks, and eventually it'll shrink to nothing. At the same time, people are less and less willing to loan you money to back you up. So, over time, an entrepreneur that's consistently bad will have no access to capital. He'll lose his own, and no one else will lend him anything at reasonable rates. Okay? At that point, that entrepreneur drops out of the ranks of promoter entrepreneurs and becomes... Now, he doesn't... People mistake this whole idea of the natural selection process in the market. We're not saying the strong survive and the weak die. What we're saying is that those entrepreneurs that don't best cons- serve consumers in the cheapest possible way go out of business and become, they don't die, they become laborers like the rest of us. Okay? They just fall from the ranks of this very elite class. Okay? On the other hand, the ones that make consistently correct decisions become larger and larger players and control more resources in the economy. Now, by control, I mean they can't control them for their own benefit. If they want to remain entrepreneurs, they have to control them for the benefit of consumers. Now, the question then arises, well, once you've become successful, you have amassed all this financial power, this access to credit markets, can't you then go on and, 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 and be successful and prevent other entrepreneurs from coming in? No, that's not true. You can be enormously successful and then make one wrong move and you'll be out. You can lose a lot of money and just be out of the ranks. Okay? So past the success does not ensure future success. Okay, the example I used to give my, um, my, cl- my, my undergraduate class was Coors Beer, which is a great example of how uh, a company that was very, very successful initially made a series of, of blockhead errors and then basically suffered for it. Now, eventually Coors have, has come back, the Coors uh, Brewing Company, um, and have become successful again. But uh, for a long time, 
they had um, they had made errors that that cut into their profits. Uh, let me give you an example. Let me let me just give you some a little bit of the background here. Um, back in the early 1970s, the beer company began to change the way they market beers. Okay, the beer industry. Um, Philip Morris, which was a cigarette company, took over uh, Miller Breweries, okay, which uh, produced Miller beer. And what they did was they brought the strategy of market segmentation, okay, which was always operative in the cigarette industry, where they would make um, menthol cigarettes, non-menthol cigarettes, cigarettes that um, appeal to women, and so on. They segmented their markets. They, that is, they tailored their products to specific groups of consumers, which is a great idea. Um, the beer companies began to do that. So in the mid-1970s, they began to, to advertise heavily in, uh, in, during sporting events to appeal to the, to the young male market. So you saw, you saw these very famous Miller commercials with uh, some football players and coaches uh, you know, drinking Miller beer and, and ripping through these uh, big banners and so on. A very uh, successful advertising campaign. But Miller also then began to realize that people were becoming conscious of their weight and that women, more women were drinking beer. So they introduced the light beer. Okay? They also saw that incomes were going up in the 1970s, that you had the beginning of the yuppie phenomenon, um, where younger couples were spending more money on, on types of cons consumer goods. So they took over uh, an imported beer, Lowenbrow, and they offered that as sort of an upscale beer. Um, their main competitor, um, which was Anheuser-Busch, began to do the exact same thing. They responded by doing the, the same types of things, advertising heavily during um, sporting events. Uh, they came up with uh, Michelob as their upscale weekend beer for, for you know, upscale couples. Uh, they, 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 they introduced Michelob Light and Bud Light to compete as light beers. Now, what did Coors do? Coors, Coors had a, a, a cult following in the 60s and 70s. College students loved Coors beer because it was very light tasting. Even before we had diet beer, it was, it was, it was a light beer, okay? And it was made with Rocky Mountain water, and, 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 and it tastes a little bit better. And, and so, so it had a lot of things going for it. And it was a darling of Wall Street uh, for a while. Okay, but they, they made a number of, of, of um, arrogant decisions in a way. Decisions that ignored the consumers. They said, they ignored the light beer phenomenon for a long time. They said, our beer is light enough for our consumers. We're not going to introduce another light beer. Okay, they'll just increase our costs. Um, also, they... Um, other, other breweries were replacing copper. Copper had gone up tremendously in price. Okay? There's another cha a change in the economy. Uh, so that for a while, pennies were disappearing because the copper in a penny was worth more melted down than it was as, as, as a penny. So pennies were disappearing. So what did the breweries do? They got rid of their copper pe piping and they began to replace it with the cheaper plastic. Um, Coors didn't do this. They listened to their engineers. The engineer says, no, no, no. You know, if you get rid of that, there'll be a slight change in the taste of the beer and this and that. So they continue to have high costs of, of purchasing copper. Um, they also try to appeal to the sort of the environmentally minded. They introduced the first non-throwaway pop top. Okay, that was even before Coke introduced it. But the way they introduced it was a. a um, this is the top of the beer can. There are two raised bumps on it, so you had to put two fingers on it and push down. Okay, w women weren't strong enough to do it, and, and it was very awkward. And if you tried to do it for a woman, you do it, and it would spill all over. All, it would go flying. You, and obviously, I mean, this is not politically correct, but you couldn't you couldn't open it up when you were driving. Well, you could, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that was that's just a, I'm reporting on a historical fact there. I'm not. So that so so there there can't it it, it, it failed. The other thing was college students were bringing this stuff back to the East Coast, it was only a market on the West Coast do, uh, during, uh, when I came back from Easter vacation, Christmas vacation. And uh, very little was getting to the West Coast because it had to be, uh, to the East Coast, it had to be refrigerated. But there was big demand for it. So I remember when I was in Boston in, in the 1970s going to college, I think it was 650, a six pack, and, and uh, you know, this is when, in the days in which, um, let's say, Budweiser was 250. Very expensive. They didn't invest in shipping it. Okay? They didn't open a brewery on the East Coast. To make a long story short, they began to lose a lot of money. Okay? And uh, from being very successful, they, they, began, they, they began to lose money. And they, they eventually changed. They didn't go out of business, they changed. They introduced the light beer. They, 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 they got rid of the stupid pop-top idea. Uh, and, and, and so on. Okay? They cut their costs. And, but my whole point is that no matter how successful that, that you are, there's no 
um, way that you can, that, that will guarantee future success. Every, to put, put it another way, it's consumers that determine which entrepreneurs are successful and which are not on a daily basis. Every purchase of anything is a vote for one entrepreneur and against another entrepreneur. Okay? So it's the consumers that ultimately control which entrepreneurs are, are um, successful and which are not. Now let me just say a few other things. Let me just confront a few myths about profits and entrepreneurs. Uh, the first thing is that, let's go back to profits for a moment. Profits are not a return to a factor of production. Wages are a return to a factor of production. They're a return to labor. Okay? A concrete input in production. Um, rent is a return to, to land another, and, and to capital goods. Another concrete um, factor of production. But what about profit? Well, you could say, well, it's a return to the factor of production entrepreneurship. But, uh, but, but entrepreneurship is not a factor of production. Entrepreneurship is... And, and you, can see it, you can see it in the following way. If profits were returned to a factor of production, they could never be negative. But in fact, they are negative. They can be negative. They can be losses. So, wages can never be negative. Rents can never be negative. That should give you pause. They are not a return to a factor of production. They are re returned to a spiritual decision. A decision about how to use factors of production. Okay? Unfortunately, many neoclassical textbooks act as if entrepreneurship is just one of the many, one of the, of, of the factors of production and profits are its reward. But that's not true. A decision can be right or wrong. Okay? That's why profits can be positive or negative. If the decision is right, they're positive. If it's wrong, okay, it's, they're negative. Something else that you should um, realize. Profits are never normal. It's wrong, for example, to say that... Um, as many times public utilities do, oh, we just want to earn a, a, a normal profit. We just want government to, to ensure us a normal profit. But there is no such thing as a normal profit. If you make bad decisions, you should lose money. If you make good decisions, decisions that cut costs to consumers or introduce new products that they're interested in, you should earn profits. The higher the profit, the greater the maladjustment in the economy that is indicated by it. In other words, um, when, 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 when the price of natural gas shot up and the price of oil shot up recently, what that was telling us, those high profits, that result from the higher prices, was that there was not enough oil and natural gas in the economy given consumer supply and demand, given, given consumer demands. Okay? So, what you want to happen then is entrepreneurs to allocate more resources to correcting that maladjustment. Right? So, at the same time that profits always indicate a maladjustment, they indicate that not enough of one good is being produced and too much of another good is being produced. At the same time that they indicate the maladjustment, they also indicate that what's happening. By the very fact that someone's earning that profit, it implies that they're beginning to correct the maladjustment. Okay? So high profits indicate great maladjustments in the economy. But they also indicate that someone is, is clearing it up and that new people will be drawn in to further correct the maladjustment. So profits are never normal. They are always due to... Um, a miss, uh, let's say, uh, well, let's just simply say a maladjustment between what is being produced and what consumers would most like to have produced. Okay, that's where the maladjustment lies. One other point I want to make. Um, people who earn high profits should not be blamed for the scarcity of the product. Okay, it's often said, well, high profits result from a firm restricting supply. Okay. But you should keep in mind that the person that's in the industry producing that product is obviously not restricting supply. That person is producing more. It's the other persons, the people that have not, did not see that profit opportunity and that have not entered that are responsible for that scarcity and the high profit. So it's precisely the wrong person to blame the oil companies for prices of oil being high and profits in the oil industry being high. It's those other uh, entrepreneurs that have not entered the oil, oil industry and, 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 and built new refineries and began to refine oil that are responsible. Let me give you an example of this, and I'll, I'll end with this example. Um, let's take uh, an isolated area of the United States. Let's say the um, Appalachian Mountains, um, say in Kentucky. Okay? So you have an isolated area, you have people poor people living in this area, and um, you have some clinics and doctors on the outskirts of the area. Okay? 
And the, these people occasionally come to these clinics. And let's assume that one clinic, Clinic A, or Dr. A, notices that there's an ap epidemic about to break out in, in this area. Okay? So what he does is he rushes in, invests, and sets up a clinic right in the middle of the area. He's correcting his forecast. Um, there's a big epidemic. People are beating down his doors. Okay? He earns huge profits. Now, do you blame that doctor for the maladjustment of medical services in that area? Or do you blame B, C, D, E, and F? Well, I wouldn't blame any of them. These people just made an entrepreneurial error. This, but this guy is certainly the least to blame. Right? But, and of course, his high prices will cause them to set up temporary clinics. Will draw them in. So the maladjustment will be cleared up over time. Okay? You don't say, oh, he's restricting supply. I mean, he's, you know, he could be working, he could be working instead of eight hours, he's working 16 hours. No, you don't say that. 